it's hooked up to a battery, such that that's the positive end of the battery. And that means that conventional current is going to be going up the front and down the back. Conventional current is going up the front and down the back. And that means I've got a north pole here and a south pole there. And we call that solenoid number one. Solenoid number two, a little bit longer. And it's hooked up to a battery the other way, so that the conventional current goes out of the positive and up the back and down the front, up the back, down the front. That makes a north pole here and a south pole there. Now, if you're not seeing how I'm getting those north poles and south poles, the final exam is going to be a total mystery. It's just going to be a, just a bad experience, okay? Bad experience. So you should be able to use right hand rule number three and quickly figure out which is the north pole of a, of a loop or a solenoid. Now, once you've replaced the loop or the solenoid with the bar magnet, drag yourself back to third grade. Don't be using any fancy reasoning. Just say, if I had two bar magnets sitting on the table, north, a south pole against a south pole, what would they do? They'd repel each other. And so these two are repelling each other. Now, the first part of that question asks, is there an induced current in coil number one if I hold these in place, if I, if I screw them down to the table so they can't move? Well, no, if the battery keeps on pumping the same amount of current through each coil, I'm not changing the, the flux, the number of field lines, through either one of those coils. And so there's no induced current anywhere. Now, the second part of this problem, we take this coil and we move it to the right. And we ask, is there an induced current? Oh yeah. And which direction does it flow? Well, to figure out which direction it flows, we need to look at the change in external flux. Now, initially, the external flux points that way. What do I mean by external? The flux due to what? Coil two. Yeah, coil one is where I'm looking for the induced flux. So external is anything that's not coil one. That's coil two. And since this is a south pole, field lines are going to come into a south, so the field lines are going to be pointing towards that south pole. <coughs> now as I get this coil one closer, I'm going to have more field lines from coil two that are going through coil one. My external flux gets bigger. Does that make sense? Now, the change in flux is what I'm interested in. What do I have to add to this initial short vector to get a final long vector? I've got to add something in the same direction. And there's the plus sign right there. We add vectors when we put them tail to head to tail. Now, the induced flux is what fights that change. So if the change is to the right, the induced flux has to point to the left. Now in order for induced flux to go through this to the left, that means induced current has to go up the front and down the back by right hand rule number three. The induced current is going to go up the front, down the back. Well, that's the same direction as the battery current. I've got two kinds of current, two flavors in that coil. The battery current, which causes a north pole here, and the induced current, which causes a north pole there. So what I'm doing is I'm strengthening the total current through this coil, making this a stronger south and this a stronger north. So as this coil one gets closer to coil two, 
What happens to that repulsive force? Yeah, it gets stronger for two reasons. Once, one is I'm getting those poles closer together, and two, the poles are getting stronger. So the, the repulsion is greater. Check that your neighbor's okay with that. So where we live up here in Bozeman, field lines are going down into the earth. The magnetic field due to the earth is going down into the earth. If you lived down here where the penguins live, you'd be standing on a street and the field lines, if you could see them, would be coming up out of the, out of the pavement. They'd just be popping right up. Okay? So let's get ourselves a smart light. A smart light, here we go. There's a smart light. That's the coil that's in the pavement, okay? As you drive your car over that coil, you're changing the number of field lines through that loop from maybe three coming up to 53 coming up because your engine is lined up, its magnetic field is lined up with the Earth's magnetic field. So the question is, what direction would the induced current flow, clockwise, counterclockwise, or I don't know, trying, okay? So maybe we're just guessing and there's a 50-50 chance. A whole lot of the final exam are going to be these kind of questions over and over and over again. What direction is the induced current? Is it clockwise or counterclockwise? And this is the way you think of it. You fight the change. I got three field lines coming up out of that, uh, that loop. And then, just a moment later, there's 50 coming out. What if they're cockroaches? I had three cockroaches coming out, then 50 cockroaches. Ah! Fight the change, fight the change. Do I send more cockroaches out or send them back the other way? Back the other way. Back the other way. With your right thumb, back the other way. And which direction is the current flowing? Clockwise. People. Do it for me, okay? Just get it right. <laughs> okay. Now, last day, we were talking about this thought experiment by Faraday. And you remember, we had copper rails 
hooked to a light. And between the rails, we had a uniform magnetic field that was generated somehow. We had a copper bar that was free to slide on those rails. And we found that if we took our hand and pushed the rail, I'm sorry, the bar, along the rails, that we got a current going through the bulb. Now, we could explain this current because moving the bar was moving the charge carriers. We were moving charges this way towards the open door in a magnetic field that way, and that pushed the current up the bar. And once it started flowing up the bar, what goes around comes around. Now, here's the thing. We learned in 205 that once something gets moving, it wants to keep moving. That was Newton's first law. A body in motion stays in motion. So if I could get rid of the friction between these copper rails and that bar, all I would have to do is just get the bar moving. If those rails were long enough, I could just have free energy the rest of my life. Free energy. When someone tells you you're going to get free energy, what do you wonder? Yeah, what's the catch? What's the catch? And what we find is that as you're pushing this rail, as soon as you let go, instead of just keeping going forever, it grinds to a halt immediately. Okay? And here's why. This current, or this motion, was caused by a magnetic force. My hand was pushing the charges this way in a field, and the magnetic force pushed the charges up that, that <coughs> bar. But once the charges are moving up that bar, that's another motion in a magnetic field. And if they're moving that way, in a magnetic field that's that way, that gives me another magnetic force that's going to point that way by right hand rule number one. And that will fight the motion. So that if I want to keep that bulb lit, I have to continually push with my hand, always overcoming that magnetic force. And that means I have to be doing positive error. That's where the light's coming from. That's where the energy's coming from. It's not free. Now we can use that same principle to uh, develop what are called magnetic brakes. I have here a copper ring, and I'm going to swing that between the poles of this horseshoe magnet, and you see that it very quickly just stops. Now, if I were to put that in liquid nitrogen and cool it down, it would stop even faster. I have here another ring. The people in front will testify that it has a, a, a cut in it, right? Okay, you'll be my, my witnesses. Okay, and in this case, I can't get any induced current set up, and so it just keeps on going. Okay? Now let me explain that. If I just had a <coughs> copper sheet swinging down, and what are these X's right here? Incubators. Yeah, these are the magnetic field lines that are going away from you, okay? So you've got a north pole near you, there's a south pole away from you, and the field lines are going from north to south. Now, I can think of this sheet of copper as a whole bunch of copper loops, one inside the other. And as I move that copper sheet through the magnetic field, I'm changing the number of field lines that are passing through. Well, let's just pick a copper loop, that copper loop there. As this swings through, did you hear that? Did you hear that? That's the crescendo. Oh, I love that. Okay. Now, as this is swinging down, I'm changing the number of field lines through this copper loop from none to some into the board. Fight that change. I'm going from no field lines into the board to some field lines into the board. Which way do I send field lines? 
out of the board, out of the board. Do it with your right thumb every single time, out of the board. And that means the current has to flow counterclockwise by right hand rule number three. Now what I care about is what's the current doing right here where it's acted on by the magnetic field. Well right there it's going up and that's current in a magnetic field into the board that gives me a magnetic force that fights the motion. Fights the motion. Now let me show you that. I've got a, a bar of copper and if I put that on here Okay. It slows right down. Now if I take a bar of copper and I turn it into a cone, I've got cuts here so that I can't get any current loops. In that case, predict what's going to happen. Yeah, if I can't get any induced current loops, I don't have any magnetic force and there's no breaking. Now, now this is going to be cold. Uh, okay. I got ten fingers, I can spare a few. I can do this. Okay. Watch what happens now. Okay. <laughs> Imagine you're using uh, uh, magnetic brakes on your uh, bullet train. And their bullet train over in Japan just uh, made a new record 375 miles an hour. That's faster than my car will go. Uh, and suppose they do the magnetic brakes and someone says, hey, you know, we cool a little down for you. And then we come to the next stop, next station. Oh, we stop. Everyone's right up at the front of the train. Uh, yeah. Uh, Okay. Now, what I have here, uh, and you're going to get to play with this, um, I have a very expensive piece of copper, a big copper disc, um, that has been sitting in a bath of liquid nitrogen. And it's been boiling away that liquid nitrogen because liquid nitrogen wants to boil at 320 below zero. And for the longest time, this was dry. Because whenever some liquid nitrogen splashed on it, it would quickly evaporate or vaporize, uh, boil, if you will, away. But now, I've got a very, very wet surface on top of here with some white uh, powder. And uh, the fact that it's wet means that it's now at 320 degrees below zero, because now it doesn't boil away the liquid nitrogen. The white powder is liquid oxygen being uh, condensed from the air. And I know that because if you drip that onto a fire, uh, you get fireworks. Uh, liquid oxygen is rocket fuel, okay? Rocket fuel. Now, I'm gonna have to move this demo to make it safe. I have here a neodymium magnet that is bigger than the ones that you've used in lab. This one is so big and so powerful that they will only sell you one at a time. Why? Because the, when you got the little ones, the first thing you did in lab was what? Yeah, you put them on your nose, one on each side. <laughs> yeah, these, if you put them one on each side of your arm, it'll break your arm. Okay, yes. they call them a crusher. So, that's why I moved that magnet over there. <laughs> okay, now, um, when I have something that has a very low resistance, it means it doesn't want a change in the number of field lines that go through it. 
there's field lines coming out of this thing, okay? And so it doesn't want those field lines to go through that copper that's very low resistance. And so when I try to bring it close to the copper, it fights me. I try to touch it and it just bounces right off. Now, if I spin this, <laughs> now, if I try to pull it off, it's hard. It, 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 it fights me going in and it fights me coming off. And, oh. Okay, now, if I could make this super conducting, copper doesn't go super conducting at these temperatures, but some metals do. If I could get a metal that was super conducting, I could do something really interesting with it. Uh, some of you may have seen this on the intertubes. Come on. Okay. So what do you think we got here? So we have quantum locking. The, the superconductor is locked in space and it stayed wherever I put it. You see? This is it refuses to have any change in the number of field lines. Amazing. Space. As long as it's... So the supercon is superconducting. It's it frozen with liquid nitrogen. Upside down. Right. And it stays locked. So the fact that it's, it's superconducting is locking the magnetic field in yeah. three dimensions, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's and you see, because this is symmetric, it can rotate without breaking, without break the locking. The locking doesn't break. Right. Because it so it stays there on the, the x and y, but not on the but the, it pivots on the yeah on the axis of all <clears> the <throat> magnets. If you see if I can move it yeah. on the side, it will again pivot around the axis of the magnet because. It makes sure that uh, the magnetic field inside of it stays the same. Right. So, Sean, can you put it on the track for us? Yeah. I just let me get it about the track Wi Fi. And I can just rotate it. So, it's actually floating above the surface. Yeah, it was floating, it's locked above the surface. So, it could, tilt, it could tilt it at an angle and it would yeah, still fly around. Yeah, like this, and it would just go around like this. <laughs> and put it at a different height and then like this. Lock it at the height. Lock right. it, yeah, different height, different configuration. Right. And I can even lock it at the uh, opposite way. If you can just hold for a minute. Right. High. And then you so it can hang upside down. Locking it upside down and then it is suspended. Fantastic. You. <laughs> And you've heard me say this before, you are just the most wonderful, hardworking, intelligent, honest, just basic good people. And again, it's not your fault. Uh, I blame your parents. You have really good parents. But I have fallen in love with the students of Montana, and I intend to be buried in my backyard. I'm never moving from Bozeman. So, uh, thank you for making this a Let's talk about generators. This is how we light up the city. We uh, let water spill over the edge of a dam. It falls a far distance, gaining a lot of kinetic energy. And then we use that kinetic energy to turn turbines at the bottom. Those turbines are used to turn coils in a magnetic field. Now, any time I turn copper coils in a magnetic field, I'm changing the number of field lines that pass through the loop. Think of this loop as a butterfly net. And think of these magnetic field lines as butterflies. I'm catching butterflies, right? Now what am I doing? I'm just making a map. Okay, I'm just hitting butterflies. They're not going through the net. Okay, so to catch them, I gotta go this way. If I turn this loop in that magnetic field, I'm catching butterflies, I'm not. I'm catching butterflies, I'm not. I'm catching butterflies, I'm not. I'm constantly changing the number of field lines that pass through this loop. 
Now we learned that that induced current is energy. It has to come at a cost. That means I, if I'm the one turning the loop, have to do positive verk. Well, that tells me immediately which direction the current is going to be traveling in that loop. If I turn it that way, the current's going to be traveling that way. How do I know? Because that current would give me a dipole, a little magnetic north and south, <coughs> that is lined up with the external field. Now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to turn that loop. And if that dipole is lined up with the magnetic field, turning the loop is going to force the dipole the way it doesn't want to go. Think of that dipole as a compass needle. It wants to stay there. And I'm forcing it, I'm forcing it against the field. As soon as I get it anti-aligned, if it stayed like it is now, it would be helping me turn. But no, it changes direction so that I'm always, always fighting that dipole. And the bigger the current, the bigger the fight. Pat, hmm. you're having a hard time staying awake, you're yawning there. Come on, I've got something for you. We're going to use Pat's uh, Mondo muscles to light up our city. Come over here, Pat, and turn this crank. Uh, he is the hydroelectric dam, and he is turning the crank right now. Nobody's got their lights on. It's middle of the night. It's really quite easy to turn, isn't it? Yeah. All he's doing is fighting friction. I turn on a light. Oh, that made it harder. Yeah. Okay. Now there's current in that loop in the magnetic field, and he has to fight that dipole. Now, if I turn on another light in parallel, I double the current. Oh. <laughs> And if I triple the current, ah. now, keep turning it, there's one more switch I can turn, and this will short out the system, make the resistance go to negligible, and one, two, three, oh. And that's what happens if everyone in, in Los Angeles turns on their air conditioner at the same time. You're done. Let's give it right now. If all of those air conditioners are, are connected in parallel, when they're all turned on at once, that essentially lowers the resistance of Los Angeles down to zero. And, and suddenly we're asking for a huge amount of current, meaning all of that current has to go through the coils that are being turned by the turbines. Well, if I have so much current and so much of this uh, fight that the falling water can't turn the turbines fast enough, then I get a brownout and no one gets uh, their air conditioner. Okay, I have a motor here in that fan, but I also have a generator. In every single motor, electric motor, you will find built in a generator. You can't get around it. And it's not a bug, it's a feature, okay? Let's think of the coil inside of an electric motor. I want that coil to turn all on its onesies, okay? So I very cleverly figure out how to make the current go exactly the way I want it to, and that would be this way, so that the dipole would be anti-aligned with the external magnetic field. I do that because that dipole is going to want to line up, and that's going to turn the coil, okay? Now, as soon as that coil gets lined up, I switch the direction of the current using those commutators, those bushing brushes, if you will. But that's done through engineering. That's done by design to make it turn. But as soon as, soon as that loop starts to turn in the external magnetic field, suddenly I'm changing the number of field lines through the loop. And that's going to cause a second current, an induced current, and it's going to be in the opposite direction of the battery current. How do I know that? Because the battery current is trying to make it turn, and the induced current is trying to fight that turn. And so the induced current is going to give me a dipole in the opposite direction. 
This red one's trying to line up. That's what's turning the motor. The green one is fighting it. And you can see that as it turns, I get right here, and now the green one would be helping, and the red one would be fighting, but I use the commutators to change the red one, and nature changes the green one. Pow! And now the red one's helping, and the green one's fighting. Again, I get to this point, the commutator, commutator changes the red one, nature changes the green one. Okay? Now, this is a feature. Let me explain what I mean by that. If I have a motor, and that motor has a coil with 4 ohm resistance, and I plug it into the wall, V equals R, 120 volts with 4 ohms, gives me a current of 30 amps. That's huge. You don't want 30 amps going through anything for very long. And it doesn't go through the motor for very long, just until the motor starts turning. Then you get this second current, the, con uh, the induced current, that's, that's opposite the direction. We call it a back EMF, a voltage that's fighting the wall voltage. So now when I use V equals IR, I got 120 volts trying to make it turn. I've got 118 volts trying to stop it, and that gives me I times 4 ohms. This is 2 volts equals I times 4 ohms, or I is equal to a half amp. Now, you know from 205 that once I get something spinning, it just wants to keep spinning. That's the natural way of things. So when I've got a, a motor, I have, to, I have to work to get it to start spinning, but once I get it started, I just have to fight friction, and it'll keep going. Well, it turns out that when you plug in a motor, before it starts turning, you got 30 amps going through the coils. That's a lot of torque that's getting that thing going. But once it starts spinning, once it gets up to speed, you get this back EMF so that really all you got going through is half an amp. And that's all you pay the company for is half an amp. And that's what's required to overcome <laughs> the friction. Now you know that if you've got an electric motor, say in a hairdryer in your bathroom, if suddenly that hairdryer jams, you, what's the next thing to happen? It bursts smoke and then it bursts into flame. Because once it stops turning, you no longer have that induced current, you no longer have the back EMF, and suddenly you've got 30 amps going through a device that was only designed to handle half an amp. And it's going to melt in your hand, not in your mouth. Okay? So, we've run out of time. We'll talk more about this on Monday. Have a great weekend, and bless you people.